reminder about uh, this event that's happening this week. I was right. Uh, I was wrong last lecture that it's happening uh, uh, this week. And uh, this is, uh, I see the contrast is terrible, but uh, it's, there, there are two sets of events. There's, uh, uh, there is on Thursday, there's this uh, 50th anniversary celebration of the, uh, of the establishment of the computer science department. And on Friday, there is a IEEE dedication that's supposed to be this big event. And Friday afternoon, there's the computer graphics symposium. And those of you who are not familiar with it, um, a good part of what we think of as computer graphics today was invented here in Utah. And uh, so we'll have uh, like really pretty cool people coming uh, uh, to you know, just visit this event. Um, it's going to be streamed live. So in case you can make it, there'll be at least one Turing Award winner giving a talk. Uh, like, you know, seriously awesome people. I heard that there are like 400 people flying in from all around the world uh, to attend this event. And these are not 400 random people. You know, it's not like 400 people that you just find anywhere. But uh, Utah alumni or former faculty who were involved in this, uh, in making the department what it is. So you can make it. If you can attend it, um, please do. The there is no URL here, but if you just search, go to price.utah.edu or something like that, you might find more details. Um, I think it's going to be streamed live. Another event. This is mostly for CS undergrads. Uh, there's something called the Computing Research Day that's happening. I think next Thurs next Wednesday. Uh, and the idea of this event is to connect uh, undergrads and CS who are interested in research to PhD students so that you can kind of do things. There is a URL here, cs.utah.edu slash research day. If you're interested, check it out. Um, and if you're not interested in research, I hear there's going to be refreshments and also a raffle. So maybe that will draw you in and you stay for the research. So those are the event announcements that I uh, wanted to kind of mention. Uh, related to class, there's a homework, homework four is on Canvas. It's uh, due, not in two weeks, I was wrong. You're due in one week, one week, right? Uh, next Tuesday. And uh, uh, this is about learning theory. By the, somewhere in the middle of today's lecture, you should have everything you need to do this homework. Uh, you already have a bit of, uh, you could have started the homework even now. Um, Midterms are not fully graded. I'm kind of hoping to get it get done with that in the next few days. Any questions about these things? The, the other stuff, don't ask me questions. Go to the website, figure it out. Anything about any questions about this? And I'm going to turn the lights on. I was told to keep the lights on so that people don't sleep in the back. Um, I'm not saying that those of you who are in the back are sleeping. This is just advice that I was given. Any questions? If not, I'm going to dive into where we left things off. Um, if we're talking about VC dimensions, in particular, we spent a bit of time uh, in the last lecture talking about shattering. And I want to remind you of the definition, and then we are going to work out at least one more example. So you're given a set of data points, a set of examples, any set, actually. The, I'm writing this as if it's about classifiers and sets of uh, uh, examples. But in fact, scattering is a property, is a concept that applies to sets of things and functions on those sets. So, Say you have a set of examples, let's call it F, and it's important that this set is finite. And let's say you have some function F, or actually a set of functions H, that every one of those functions can partition the uh, elements in this example to pluses and minuses. So you may have a set uh, of four things, of five things, and maybe one element of, uh, this is your set, and one element assigns plus, plus, minus, minus, minus. Another element of H does minus everywhere. Another one does plus, minus, plus, and so on. Anyway, you can have a list. A, a, every row here is a different function. 
and the set H consists of all possible function or a set of interesting functions that we are looking at that all of them have the same signature. They take an instance of this set and tag it as a plus or a minus. So they partition the data into two groups, positive and negative. Now, um, the set is said to, uh, the, the set of examples is said to be shattered by this edge. If no matter how you label the examples, there is some element in the function that also agrees with that label. So maybe, so there is this extra thing that I'm introducing here uh, of assigning labels to examples. So I have three um, functions in my set H. Let's say this is my set H. This is one function. This is another function. This is a third function. And I have a set S that is this thing. So S can be labeled as plus and minus in many different ways. In fact, there are five points and there are two power five possible ways to label that. So my set H cannot shatter that uh, set of function examples because there are two power five possible ways to label and H contains only three of them. So H does not shatter S in this example. In the, the, the last thing that we did in the previous lecture was to look at a particular, uh, a few particular sets of example uh, functions and uh, uh, see how many points they can shatter. So we looked at this hypothesis class called set of intervals, which is basically assigning, is defined by these two numbers, A and B, and saying that any number that lies between A and B is going to be labeled as plus anything that lies uh, outside is going to be labeled minus. So it partitions uh, the real line into plus and minus. Everything inside the range is plus, everything outside is minus. And I argued that you can shatter one point. So if I have a real line and I have this one point, if I give it a label plus, then I can create a range that's like this, A and B. And everything inside A and B is plus. In particular, the point that we care about is plus. If I treat the point as a minus, then maybe I put an A here and a B here. Everything inside the range is plus, but the point lies outside, so it's labeled as minus. So the set of functions, the hypothesis class that I'm considering consists of all pairs A and B of this type. So what I proved here is by exhaustively enumerating all ways to label this one point, I've proved that the set H can match that labeling no matter how that point is labeled. Then I uh, went to two points and let's say you have, let's see if I can build on top of this picture again. So I have these two points here and now I can label this in four different ways. So I can have a plus plus, plus minus, minus plus, minus minus. And if I have plus plus, I can put an A on and B on both sides. I have a plus minus, I can just cover the, um, the positive exam point alone. If I have a uh, minus uh, plus, then I can cover the positive example alone. And uh, if I have two minuses, I can put the range outside. So once again, no matter how these two points are labeled, there is some range that only covers the plus. In other words, there's no some function in this hypothesis class that perfectly will agree with my label. So the, 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 this means that uh, using following the definition, this set of two points can be shattered by the set of functions that we have. The final thing that uh, we did was to consider three points. So I have three points here and I can do the same thing again, right? I can enumerate every possible um, uh, labeling of these three points, but I'm going to only pick one labeling because in order to show that something cannot be shattered, all I need is one counter example because I want every labeling to be matched. If even one of them fails, then the set of points is not shattered. So the counter example is plus, minus, and plus. Now there is no way I can put a bracket that covers only the pluses, pluses and not the minuses, which means uh, this set of points cannot be shattered by uh, the function class. Any questions? I noticed that there was some discussion here. Did you have a question? Okay. Any questions, anyone? Yeah. 
It's shattering these particular three points. That's right. It's shattering only these particular three points. But it just so happens that on a real line, no matter where you place three points, it's going to look exactly like that. So the same counter example applies to all. If, if I pick a different set of three points, then I'm going to still use the same template. I'm going to label the middle point negative and the outside point plus. So this this what what's on the screen only shows counter examples for these three points and these three points but then there's also an argument that i'll make that i'm making that uh, the same counter example applies to all sets of three points because on a real line there's only one configuration of three points they're going to lie in a line other questions but that's a good uh, observation Sh shattering is a property of a particular set of points and a set of functions. So any other questions about shattering? We're gonna uh, build up on top of this. Yeah. It, it, usually that applies, right? I mean, if you have three or more points, if I have four points, I'll apply the same, I'll take some subset of them and uh, just apply that thing. But let's, uh, we have to be careful because if on the real line, every, things are easier. So let's actually go to one dimension more. And I want you to revisit that question uh, when we get to it. Okay. So actually, let's talk about half spaces in a plane. Half spaces in a plane is just a fancy way of saying, I have a two-dimensional uh, plane and I'm drawing a linear classifier. And that said, that separates half the space, uh, that creates a half space. A half space is basically one side of a linear, of a line. So what can we do? Can this shatter one point? So we have a two-dimensional plane. Let's, uh, let me use a different color. We have a two-dimensional plane. It doesn't really matter where the origin is, so uh, let's ignore that. I have a point. Can this point be shattered by a, a line? How would I go about proving that if I have to prove it? In order to consider shattering, I need to consider every every possible labeling of my set of points. This point can have only two labels. It can either be a plus or a minus. If it's a plus, then I can maybe draw my line like this and then they say that this side of the line is a plus. If it's a minus, what will I do? Well, I could draw the same line and say the other side is a plus. Right? So no matter what label is assigned to a set of one point, there is a high linear classifier that can match that label. So we say that the set of uh, half, the, the function class defined by half spaces in a plane can shatter one point. So one point is fine. Uh, I'm going to remove the axes because very soon, let's talk about two points, some two points in a plane. So there are two points in a plane. Can I perfectly uh, match any labeling of this? I see a lot of, I see three heads nodding, uh, four, five, six, okay. The, I, if I start counting heads nodding, then I'm just going to do a head count of the class. So I can have plus plus. I put a line here. I can have plus minus. Then the line just moves here. And this gives you minus minus. And if it's plus minus, then the line is in between. And the other, if, if I get minus plus, then the line can change, the arrow changes. Oh, something like that, right? So no matter how these two points are labeled, there is some line that can separate the pluses from the minuses. So we say that two points are shattered. Now comes the interesting bit, three points. Does anyone want to take this argument? Yes. Okay, uh, let's consider, okay, okay. I, so 
you're now dividing the set of all possible three points into two groups. Three points that lie on a line and three points that do not lie on a line. So let's consider, you said, as long as they do not lie on a line, you think it's possible. So this is a set of three points that do not lie on a line. So let's make this a little bigger. Okay, Can you, let's give these names, A, B, and C. How do you go about proving it? Since you already, since you committed to uh, proving it, let's finish the thing. So, okay, let's uh, take a concrete example. Okay, all minuses, what do you do? Draw line of this. Okay. For all pluses, you have something like this. Something like this. In fact, that's it. This is the only case. This is a general case because if one point has one label and the other two points have the other label, you just put a line between the two points and that one point. Because they do not lie on a line, there's a gap between these two things. So you can actually put a line. So if uh, to make this more concrete, if A were positive, then I draw the line here. And if A were negative and these two are positive, then I change the sign. That's That part is easy. Now, if B were positive and the other two were negative, I draw the line like this. And if C were positive and the other two are negative, then I draw the line like this. And we can prove that this is correct because these, these three points do not lie on the line. So you can always there's enough room between these to draw that line. And all you need is like a, a tiny, infinitesimally small uh, gap because the line fits through it. So three points that do not lie on a line can be, uh, that are not collinear can be shattered. Okay, let's consider the other case. Since you said as long as they do not lie on a line, what happens if they do lie on a line? I have three points that lie on a line. What happens now? Can someone else say something about this? Yes. In the case where the middle point has uh, the outside points, uh, so in this case, you cannot find a line that matches the label, right? So with three points, it gets interesting. Uh, by the way, there's another case which is uh, which you already covered, which is this one. Either one of these cannot be matched by any line because no line separates out uh, B from A and C. So we have an interesting situation. For one point, it doesn't matter where you put the point on the plane, it can be shattered. For two points, it doesn't matter where you put those two points on the plane, they can be shattered. For three points, we have to be careful. There are some sets of three points that can be shattered and there are some sets of three points that cannot be shattered. Right? Three points that lie on a line cannot be shattered. Three points that are not collinear can be shattered, which is uh, an interesting uh, uh, thing that we've not encountered before. Okay? So th that's just that. Now let's consider four points. Can someone say something about four points? Well, I've already covered the two cases for three points. So the I have already, uh, my slides are a bit of a mess, so let's consider four points. What do you say about four points? How do you prove it? I see a few heads nodding. Yeah. Just do you can do an XOR, but uh, which four points are those? Um, let's see. Uh, you have these four points, and you say that if I put a XOR type function, this cannot be matched. That's true, the XOR function is not linearly separable, but that's just these four points. What about these four points? That's a different, uh, you, you agree that on the two sides of the line, you have a different configuration. The, the one on the farther side does not match your XOR setup. What do you do there? Can that be shattered? Yes. No, you. Um, yeah. Can't you still have that one? How would you? Can you walk me through this? Well, it's just arbitrarily see into the, the four combinations here, like a map. 
Okay, you know, give me, let's give these names. Let's say A, B. Give me a labeling. Okay, well, so on the left hand side, no, no, these are the only four points we have. We are given a set of points. And the question is, can this set be shattered by linear classifier? Yes. Uh, Make the outside one called plus and the inside minus, and suddenly you cannot draw a line that separates the pluses from the minuses. So this cannot be shattered. I'm going to use, and this cannot be shattered. Okay. Can we say something more general? What about three points that, what about four? Four points that look like this. There are three points are on a line, and the fourth point is somewhere else. Someone else who's not answered. Uh, I see that you're nodding your head, you're shaking your head. So do you want to? Which is reduced down to the same three point problem. That's right. This reduces to the three point problem because if A, B, and C cannot be shattered, we don't care what. We don't care what D does because I'll just use that same template that was suggested by Tracy. So I got your name right. Okay. I'm trying to remember names and I'm almost always wrong. So if I call you the wrong thing, don't be polite and nod. Just correct me. <laughs> uh, so if I do this, this doesn't work. So let's, this also cannot be shattered. So there's something interesting here, right? Yeah. Would it true in every case where you shatter the people shattered by a two-dimensional uh, S is where D plus one may or may not be, and where it's a task one D is shattered? That's uh, that's a good sort of a generalization that you're making. I have to think a little bit about it, but I think you're right. Yeah. So the the question was, is it always the case with D dimensional, in, if I generalize this from 2D to D dimensions, D points may or may not be shatterable, but D plus one cannot. D plus one, sorry, D plus two, you have to go to D plus two. D plus two cannot be shattered. Um, let's make this more slightly more formal. Okay. The claim is no configuration of four points on a plane can be shattered. That no matter how anyone gives you four points on a plane, no matter how anyone places four points on a plane, there is no linear classifier that can shatter them. There's no, the, the, that set cannot be shattered by the set of linear classifiers. And the way to prove that is essentially we, we, we did actually go through the proof, but I want to make it a little cleaner. So the way to think about it is how many different ways can someone arrange four points on a plane? Say, well, Case one is three of the four points are collinear. If three of the four points are collinear, you get three points like this and the fourth point outside. And we have the counter counter example from before. If three points cannot be shattered, if three points on a line cannot be shattered, then you just take those three points and call them plus, minus, and plus. I don't care what happens to the outside, the point that doesn't lie on the line. Case two is no three points are collinear. But these are the only two ways in which four points can be arranged. Either three of them are on a line or no three of them are on a line. If no three of them are on a line, I'm going to argue that some three of them form a triangle, right? If no three of them are on a line, some three of them form a triangle. Let's consider three of them as being forming some triangle. Now we have to consider where the fourth point can lie. Case subcase A is fourth point outside the triangle. In this case, we get the XOR situation. So we get something like this. And I can just call uh, assign this label. And case B is fourth point in the triangle. In which case, uh, let me move this up here.
And in, in this case, you have three points that lie on a triangle and the fourth point in. I'll just give the fourth point a label that is different from the, the vertices of the triangle. So would you agree that we have only three situations that can exist? Either three points are on a line or no three points are, are on a line. If no three points are on a line, some three of them form a triangle. The fourth one can either be inside the triangle or outside the triangle. It cannot lie on the triangle because if it does, then three of them will be on a line. So it has to be inside or outside. And in each configuration, I was able to construct, assign, uh, you know, design a labeling that uh, is not linear, that makes the point not linearly separate. So what this proves is that no matter how you arrange four points on a plane, they cannot be shattered. Questions? Questions? Yes. So, to, to kind of generalize, can you just connect all negative points, like some question at the bottom and the line? And I've seen those lines in the situation and it's a contingent to the you could, but I don't know where you're going with that. What's the generalization that you're getting out of it? In the last quantum Yes. Okay. Your positive point is inside that. Something like that. Okay, I've connected, in this case, I've connected the negative and it doesn't really work. Right, in the... Um, like, you kind of get an intersection when you draw those points. You do this and this, you get an intersection of the, yeah, that's that's a way of proving that uh, the, the, the data set is not linearly separable. That way, you, you basically have constructed a sort of a, almost a computational procedure for showing that some data set is not linearly separable. Yeah. Is shadow ability uh, a superset of the linear separability? Not quite. No, I see what you mean. It is more than that. It is about a, can a finite set of points, no matter how a finite set of points are labeled, can some function in your function class match it? Right? It is linear. It just so happens that since we are dealing with linear classifiers here, we are thinking in terms of linear separability. If for example, instead of linear classifiers, the set of functions that you are uh, you are playing with is say decision trees of depth five. You would not be thinking of linear separability. You'd be thinking, okay, how would the features be set up so that no decision tree of depth five matches that? Uh, you had a question, right? Okay. Other question. Let's kind of step back and see what we've achieved here. Uh, with four points, what I have shown here is one, with, sorry, with, uh, with half spaces on a plane, what I have shown is any set of one point, any one point in the half space, uh, in the plane can be shattered by the set of half spaces. Any set of two points, no matter how they are arranged on the plane, can be shattered by half spaces. When we come to three points, there are some sets of three points that can be shattered, and there are some sets that cannot be shattered. In particular, collinear points cannot be shattered, and non-collinear points, points that lie on a triangle, can be shattered. With four points, no matter how those four points are organized on a plane, they cannot be shattered. And with five points and so on, we don't care anymore because some subset of four, we just take some subset of four and apply the same game. There was a question earlier about uh, can we say that if three points are shatterable, then four points can, uh, if three points cannot be shattered, four points. Look, this is the if these three points cannot be shattered, no matter where you put the other points, that cannot be shattered. But these two points by themselves can be shattered. These two points can by themselves be shattered, but when you put them all together, they cannot. So if you have a certain number of points that cannot be shattered, adding more points will not make them shatterable. Questions? Any questions about this idea of shattering? Yeah. The number of points that are shattered, 
Uh, I have to think about that. That's not really um, because we we have. It's not just about. It's not about ordering points arbitrarily. It's about ordering points with respect to this particular function class. Maybe if I have a different function class, I might not consider these partitions. The concept of collinearity comes into play because I'm playing. I'm working with linear classifier. This, this sort of uh, XOR type configuration comes into play because I'm working with linear classifiers. So there is no general notion of configurations of points in uh, in any dimensional space. We have to consider configuration of points with respect to this function class. Now, if you ask the same question again, uh, with respect to uh, linear classifiers, is the number of ways in which you can order points going to be uh, the number of dimensions plus one? That I have to think. Uh, I suspect not. I suspect it will be more. Um, but I'm not, I, I don't want to commit to an answer. Okay, I can see you're all eager to find out where this is going. Why are we playing this little puzzle, set of puzzles about shattering when we were actually talking about learning theory and such cool things? Well, we'll get there, we'll get there. Um, you can think of shattering as uh, an adversarial game. Uh, adversarial game that you are playing with an adversary. Suppose you want to claim that a certain hypothesis space or a certain set of functions can shatter D points. Your adversary is now going to assign, figure out a labeling of those D points such that no function in your set can uh, match that. It turns out that if, you're, uh, if there is a function, your adversary wants to make you fail. So your adversary is going to find that one labeling that makes your function class fail. And it turns out if you, if there is no way in which your adversary can make you fail, that means that these D points can be shattered. So uh, I set it up as this strange little chat that, uh, um, but you know, it, all these sort of uh, adversarial proofs take this, uh, you can think of them as this, uh, a game between two participants. There is you who wants to prove something. There's an adversary who wants you to fail. The adversary, in which case, when you are playing the game for the adversary, then you have to consider the worst possible configuration. The worst configuration for, uh, sorry, the worst sort of labeling. The worst labeling for uh, the uh, four points that lie like this is uh, something like this, right? Well, your adversary could have been a very friendly one and decided that this label is also minus, but that doesn't help your adversary. You are assuming that the adversary wants you to fail. So your adversary will never pick that labeling because you can find a classifier. Your adversary is going to try to find a labeling that makes your uh, hypothesis that fail. Now, the cool thing is that certain function classes can shatter an infinite number of points. Uh, the way to prove that a certain function class shatters an infinite number of points is to say is to be able is to show that no matter which how many points are picked, there is some function in that class that that is that can shatter it. So for all n, it's basically a statement uh, saying that for every n, if size of x equals n, then x can be This is essentially a proof. If you can prove this, then we say that that function class can shatter an infinite set of points. And the intuition is that if you have an infinite, if your function class can shatter an infinite number of points, another way to think about this is for any n, no matter how those points are labeled, there's some function in the set that can match that label. So for any, and that means that uh, your function class is uh, intuitively, an extremely rich one. There's a question. Not possible arrangement. That so no, 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 no. The statement X can be shattered by H simply means for every way in which you label those points in X there is some function in H that can shatter it. 
that can match that labeling. It's a statement about matching labeling. You're given a set and you're given uh, a function class. In this case, it's the, all you need to show is there's one set of infinite points. So the way to think about it is uh, construct x such that the size of x is n. So for any number n, if I can produce a set of n points such that it can be shattered, then the uh, number of uh, possible, uh, the we say that this function class can shatter an infinite set. Now, what if you, it's worth thinking about what kind of a function class will shatter an infinite set. So essentially, if your hypothesis class, if your, if your set of functions has absolutely no bias at all, and by that I mean it has no preference for this particular function or that particular function, it says that every function is possible. Then that function can match any function. Well, that function class can match any function. Consider, for instance, all possible decision trees. The set of functions consisting of every possible decision tree that can exist of, our, of whatever depth. No matter what data set you give me, no matter how many dimensions there are, there is some decision tree that will match it. Right? So the set of decision trees has, uh, can shatter infinite points, um, which means that uh, you know in, the, the intuition here is that if your function class can shatter more number of points, then that function class can uh, express more possible types of labelings that might exist in data, and so it is uh, it, it has fewer biases. And bias here is a technical term. I don't want to talk about that yet. We'll get to that much later. So you can uh, kind of elide that point for now. Questions about shattering, because we're going to move uh, past shattering into something that builds on top of that. Yes. Um, what was the function space and hypothesis space when you were doing this for the class? Was there other linear hypothesis space? Does that make sense? For, yeah, for uh, this stuff, right? Yeah. It was uh, it, the, the function class is half spaces on a plane. What, what that really means, this, that's just another way of saying I have a hyperplane, a line that separates the plane into a half space. So think about an you know three dimensional space. Imagine a plane that cuts through the space, the room. It cuts the three dimensional space into two half spaces, one on each side. And half spaces on a plane simply says one side is plus, the other side is minus. In other words, we have a linear classifier that partitions the plane in the 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 space into two regions. So why can't we use a polynomial function or this You could, but that's a different function class. It is because it's a, we are talking about a particular. When we talk about shattering, we always talk about a particular set of functions. So it it turns out that a linear classifier in three dimensions cannot, uh, 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 sorry, in two dimensions cannot shatter any arrangement of four points. Of course, if I have a degree two polynomial, that's no longer true. You can draw little circles that only go around the positives. It's almost not true. There is like a little bit of a, there are some four points that can be shattered for sure. So we always have to commit to a set of functions. All right. I think we can now, we've explored shattering enough. We can build on top of that to introduce the VC dimension, the idea of VC dimension. Uh, just to remind you, the definition of shattering is if a, a set of examples is shattered uh, by a set of functions, if every partition of the examples into plus and minus uh, can be matched by some function in the function class, that, uh, that matched meaning it also, that function assigns the exact same labels. The VC dimension, Vapnik one n case dimension of a hypothesis space, basically a set of functions, is simply the large is the size of the largest finite uh, set of instances that can be shattered by that hypothesis space. 
So if you imagine that you have an instance space X, the instance space consists of potentially an infinite number of uh, points, like in some feature space, right? The, uh, in, remember, instance space consists of all possible examples that may exist that do not exist yet. Possibly in the future, these examples might show up. When we talk about instance spaces as being feature spaces, really we're talking about, you know, this is an instance space consisting of two features, X1 and X2, then infinite set. So instance spaces can be an infinite set. For VC dimension, what we do is we consider a finite subset of that instance space. In other words, we consider a finite set of points that come from that instance space and ask, can that finite set be shattered by the set of functions? If it can, then the VC dimension is at least that much. If it cannot, that doesn't mean the VC dimension is not that much. We need to show that every possible finite subset cannot be shattered. In that case, the VC dimension is not. So it's the size of the, if I produce one set of examples of a certain size, a set consisting of a certain number of examples that can be shattered, then the VC dimension is at least that much. If there exists any subset of size D that can be shattered, then the VC dimension is at least D. Even one subset will do. If no subset of size D can be shattered, then the VC dimension is strictly less than D. Let's kind of enumerate what we, with the, with the linear classifiers, we can enumerate them. There is at least one subset of linear classifier of points of size one that can be shattered. Right. It turns out every set of uh, one point can be shattered. So the VC dimension is at least one. Now we consider two points. Every set of two points can be shattered. So the VC dimension is at least two. With three points, there are some sets of three points that cannot be shattered. Three points lying on a line cannot be shattered. But there's at least one set of three points that can be shattered. In fact, an infinite set consisting of all three points that form these sorts of triangles. So any subset, so all we need is one. We don't need an infinite set. We, if I can find one set of three points that can be shattered, that means the VC dimension is at least three. Then we go to four. No set of four points can be shattered. How do I know that? I just proved it. No matter how four points can be arranged on a plane, they cannot be shattered. That means VC dimension is strictly less than four for linear classifiers. So essentially what we just proved is that the VC dimension of uh, linear classifiers in 2D is strictly less than four because no, no set of four points can be shattered. And it is less than or equal to, it's more than or equal to three. VC dimension has to be a natural number. So what's the VC dimension of linear classifiers? It's a natural number that is at least three, but not four. Well, it's three. Essentially, what I just proved without actually telling you about it is that VC dimension of linear classifiers in two dimensions is exactly three. Why? Because there's at least one set of three points that can be shattered and no set of four points can be shattered. Every VC dimension proof has these two components. The lower bound says that at least one set of examples of those many of that size can be shattered. You need to construct that one example. The upper bound says no matter how you pick examples of that, that size, they cannot be shattered. So you need to enumerate all possible configurations of examples. In fact, we've managed to prove a few VC dimension things in class. The VC dimension of half intervals, which is basically, uh, I, have a, I have a number A and anything from zero to A is positive and anything outside is negative. The VC dimension of half intervals is one. Why? Because there is a data set of size one that can be shattered and no set of examples of size two can be shattered. We proved this in class uh, on Tuesday. Oh, there's a question. Uh, what is the, the question is, what's the VC dimension of the hypothesis space consisting of all decision trees? The large, the, I said before that the largest uh, finite subset of the instance space that can be shattered by uh, all decision trees is infinite. So, in other words, decision trees can shatter an arbitrary number of points. In that case, the VC dimension of decision trees is actually infinite. The set of all, all decision trees. Um, we also looked at the set of intervals, which are bounded on uh, both sides 
by two numbers, A and B, and everything in between is plus, and everything on both sides is minus. There is a data set of size two that can be shattered. There's no data set of size three that can be shattered, which means that uh, the VC dimension of interval in the, on the real line is two. And we just, uh, uh, I just mentioned that VC dimension of half, uh, half spaces in the plane is three. Questions? Your entire homework, a good part of your homework asks you to prove uh, or compute VC dimensions of uh, uh, function classes. And it's, it's worth approaching it from first principles. The way to do it is remember that every VC dimension proof has two sides. You need to show that the VC dimension is at least some number by constructing a set of examples of that size that can be shattered. What does it mean to construct a, a, the what can it, what does it mean to show that that set of examples can be shattered? Well, you have a set of examples and then you enumerate every possible labeling like we did before and show no matter how the labeling uh, those points are labeled, there's some function that matches that. That's the lower bound. For the upper bound, you need to consider every possible arrangement of those many points. No matter how points can be uh, produced, there is at least one counterexample, one bad labeling, that, like the example that we did for the linear classifier. No matter how four points are arranged on a plane, there is at least one way to label those four points such that no function matches them. So every VC dimension proof has these two sides. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky. It's not, diff it's not actually difficult, it's just confusing. Because in, on one side, you have to consider all possible labelings. For the lower bound, for the upper bound, you have to consider all possible configurations of points. And uh, the most common mistake that I've seen people do with this is consider, for example, uh, you know, swap, uh, get confused with this. Basically, it, there are many ways to confuse. Uh, so what I would encourage you to do is go back through this lecture and prove to yourself that these statements are correct. Prove to yourself that the VC dimension of intervals on the line is two, for example. Questions about VC dimension? Yeah. That's right. There are uh, just at this point, I'm just going to list out a few more VC dimensions. Um, if we looked at uh, linear classifiers in two dimensions, the, the linear classifier in D dimensions has a VC dimension of D plus one. I'm not going to prove it. The VC dimension of arbitrary neural networks, this is a very, very loose statement because this is a huge function class. And this is also a very loose statement. It is often equivalent to the number of parameters. There are Easy counterexamples, but uh, you know, like standard neural networks that we might encounter, the VC dimension behaves like the number of parameters. We have not considered nearest neighbors classifier, but one nearest neighbor, if you are familiar with it, we will deal with it later. It turns out it has an infinite VC dimension. And the intuition is a richer set of functions, a more complex set of functions, a complicated set of functions, really, can shatter a larger set of points. As a result, it has a more its VC dimension is more. Um, it just so happens that uh, with linear classifiers, the number of cl parameters we need is also D plus one. You have D dimension, so you, you, have, you have a weight vector with D elements and a bias term. So you have D plus one. So this is really a generalization of uh, the neural network result. Um, there are more complexities with learning neural networks, which I'm not going to mention right now. But uh, uh, you know, when we get to these parts of the lecture, you can kind of revisit this at the end. After we, in particular, uh, after we visit nearest neighbors, um, I want you to kind of uh, give yourself a future exercise of trying to prove that its VC dimension is infinite. That's a fun exercise to prove. Questions about VC dimension?
we've been talking about shattering and VC dimension for a while now. I never really told you why we are doing this. And you kind of played along because you know, you're probably thinking, yeah, this guy knows what he's doing. Um, there is a reason why we are going through this. And the reason is, uh, remember this, uh, these results on sample complexity, where we proved this uh, idea of Occam's razor for the, uh, the, the case where uh, the con you have a consistent learner and we also proved an Occam's razor for the agnostic learning case. And in both cases, it turns out, it turned out that the sample complexity uh, for proving PAC bound depended on the log of the size of the hypothesis space. So the, the key thing that you needed to compute was given a set of functions, what's the number of elements in that set of functions, and take the log of that. If that is polynomial in the dimensionality, you can declare that it's PAC learnable. That did not work for infinite sets of functions because uh, log of infinity is still infinite. But it turns out we don't really need to count the set of functions for uh, infinite classes. Basically, the log of the size of the hypothesis space, or rather VC dimension, behaves like the log of the size of the hypothesis space. One of your homework questions, in fact, asks you to prove that if your set of functions is finite, then the VC dimension is the log of the set of the hypothesis space. And at this point, while I We've just looked at the, uh, the, 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 the idea of easy dimension, but you have all the tools you need to be able to prove that result. You might, you just, and the suggestion is, uh, there are a few different ways of proving it. So I'm not gonna give you the answer right now. Well, if the VC dimension behaves like the log of the size of the hypothesis space, it means that we can actually state we can prove if we care, we can definitely state um, uh, sample complexity bounds that actually show this more formally. In particular, um, we, we can have a Occam's razor type theorem where uh, imagine that you have a, a learning algorithm that finds a hypothesis that's consistent with M example in your training data. And if M is more than this obnoxious quantity, then uh, with high probability, with probability one minus delta, that particular hypothesis that is consistent with M examples is going to be, uh, is going to have an error less than epsilon. I'm not going to ask you to remember that expression. In fact, I don't really care about any other part of that expression other than to note that the sample complexity M is essentially linearly dependent on the VC dimension. If your VC dimension is a polynomial in the dimension, in the in the underlying dimensionality, then we have a packed result. So if M is polynomial in one over epsilon, one over delta, and the number of features you have, then we have a packed algorithm. To be efficient, of course, you also need to produce uh, this hypothesis uh, efficiently, but that's a different, uh, that's, a, that's about designing a learning algorithm. What, what this slide is showing, I'm not proving this result, what this slide is showing is really that if your VC dimension is polynomial in the dimensionality, and you have a situation where there is a learning algorithm that is guaranteed to be consistent with M examples, and if M is more than this quantity, then you have uh, a, you have path guarantees. This is just in the case where your learning algorithm always produces a classifier that's consistent with your training data. If you're, if you're in the agnostic setting, namely your uh, uh, you have M examples, and you don't know whether the true function belongs to your hypothesis space or not. Your learning algorithm just produces some hypothesis edge. We don't really know what the whether it's it has a zero training error or not, but we can definitely measure its training error. What this uh, awful looking expression on the slide shows, and I don't expect you to remember this. I definitely don't. You feel free to remember it if you want. Uh, what it shows is that the generalization error is no more than this quantity beyond the training error. And that quantity depends no more than polynomially on the VC dimension. We basically have another sort of a, this is the, you know, the, the, the one of the big results that we are going to uh, celebrate at the end of this unit. I'm not proving it, but really the point here is if your VC dimension is polynomial, then you 
uh, you can get away with polynomial number of examples and uh, you're done. You get this epsilon delta guarantee. Or another way of thinking about it is if your if the dimension is polynomial, then your training error is your sorry, your generalization error is not going to be much worse than your training error. How much worse? This much worse. And you can for any epsilon and delta, you can prove that you, you have that uh, that confidence that your your learning algorithm will return something that is has an error less than epsilon. This is a statement about learning algorithms and not about any cl one classifier. It's about it's a property of any learning algorithm that can produce your hypothesis. Um, you, in the beginning of this unit, we looked at this concept of axis parallel rectangles. Rectangles and every, uh, we have rectangles and everything inside is positive and everything outside is negative. It's a really great exercise to try to prove the VC dimension of that concept class. It's kind of fun. It's not as easy as the one examples that we saw. It kind of challenges uh, you to think about this a little bit more. So I encourage you to do that. That brings us to the end of uh, our lecture on pack learning or uh, computational learning theory. What you need to know is, uh, let's kind of quickly revisit all the stuff that we saw. We care about generalization error and not training error. And so you need, to, and pack learning is uh, uh, is a property of uh, learning algorithms that essentially formalizes this idea. We looked at two types of hypothesis spaces, finite and infinite. And in the finite hypothesis case, we were able to show, we proved, connections between the size of the hypothesis space and sample complexity. You should be able to derive those uh, complexity bounds and understand what they mean. Basically, the with the finite hypothesis uh, case, uh, all we care about is the number of functions in the hypothesis class. If that number is polynomial in the dimensionality, we are done. In the infinite hypothesis uh, space situation, we had to essentially come about the same concept through this idea of shattering and VC dimension. So you need to know what shattering is, you need to know what VC dimension is, and you need to be able to find the VC dimension of somewhat simple function classes. Um, if you want more complex things, come to me, I'll give you uh, questions, but uh, uh, at least for the simple stuff, like the kinds that you might see in your homework. And basically the result is uh, saying the same thing. In if you have higher VC dimensions, the sample complexity increases. So your function class gets more complicated. More generally with uh, computational learning theory, we looked at uh, uh, you know, the, this idea that uh, we have a fixed but unknown distribution over examples. And that's what this whole structure is built on top of. And we looked at Occam's razors and we looked at uh, uh, the case of agnostic learning. We looked at scattering and VC dimension. This is not the final work. There are many extensions to this theory. Uh, in fact, this is we don't we, computational learning theory does not explain all of uh, the successes of machine learning that we see in the news today. Um, there are extensions to deal with uh, uh, noise in the data of certain types. If you know that the data belongs to a certain distribution, or there are extensions to deal with probabilistic models. And uh, one cool extension is something called pack based theory, which uh, uh, make assumptions about uh, the prior distribution over, over of functions over the hypothesis. If you knew that some functions are more likely, can we somehow fold it into our theory? And I can, if you're interested in pack base, I can send you a nice tutorial on that that uh, builds on top of the kind of stuff that you've seen. Computational learning theory is not solved. There are many. Uh, examples of computational learning theory uh, of where computational learning theory does not really explain what the uh, you know the successes of our learning algorithm. One example that came up in uh, this technical report that was published by OpenAI uh, just last week actually was maybe you can't read this. So. I'll let you read this. Some of these words probably make sense, and the rest of them we are going to talk about them in the next few weeks. Statistical learning theory says a lot about learning. Uh, uh, the modern neural network usage kind of flies in the face of that, and somehow 
it still works. Uh, this is still an, uh, not completely ironic. Um, so yeah, um, you can take this in two ways. You can take this as, you know, yeah, learning theory doesn't work. Or you can take this as, oh, there's more to do in learning theory because there is uh, stuff that it doesn't explain yet. Uh, I would like to think of the think of this in this in the uh, second style because uh, there is this sort of an unknown that we cannot explain that we do not even have the mathematical language for. And you know, if this sort of stuff excites you, then try proving some uh, inventing new learning theory for why transformers make a chat what. But let's. Uh, but why do computational learning theory at all? It gives us a nice way to think about what is learnability and uh, about this question of how good is my class of function. It formalizes this notion of whether a concept class is learnable or not, and how many examples, if you had so many examples, would learning succeed? We looked at mistake bounds in the first uh, part of the class. And it turns out that if you are able to prove that some concept class is learnable in the mistake bound model, there is a standard construction that allows you to just conclude that it's also learnable in the pack model. So mistake bound learnability implies pack learnability. It raises really fun, interesting questions. Uh, one of them, which we will touch upon right now, is this idea of uh, weak learnability. If a concept class is weakly learnable, meaning there is some learning algorithm that produces a classifier, that is just slightly better than chance. Can I somehow keep calling that learning algorithm again and again to build a strong classifier? Is it does weak learnability imply strong learnability? And the other thing that uh, we've also seen, we saw this uh, 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 thing. Ignore this plus minus. This is uh, epsilon. No, this is the delta. So. We just saw this ugly big box uh, uh, statement that says, if uh, your true error, your generalization error can be no more than your training error plus this massive term that includes VT dimension and all that stuff. Can we somehow use that idea to invent a new learning algorithm? It turns out the answer to both of them is yes. Um, for the first one, uh, the answer is uh, an, a constructive proof a constructive algorithm that's called adaboost it takes us to this idea of ensembling and boosting and for the second one it takes us to this idea of structural risk minimization uh, and in, in particular something called support vector machines structural risk minimization is one of the standard the, the most sort of common uh, sort of technical tools that are that's used in machine learning today and we'll be spending quite a bit of time on that, but in particular, the instantiation of that with support vector machine. We'll get there uh, in the next few weeks. Any questions about learning theory? This is the last thing I'm going to say about learning theory. So, are there any questions, or do you want? Are you done with it, and you want me to move on? Or is there a third option that you're all silent about? Yes. Say that again. Yeah. I want to minimize my generalization error, right? Instead of minimizing my generalization error, can I minimize this quantity here? And is and the way to the way it, so it's not enough to just minimize the training error. You need to minimize training error plus something else. That something else is designed to make the VC dimension small. And that way you get like, you get better generalization. That's the uh, rough idea. 